be careful what you ask for. I am reading from 1 Samuel chapter 8, 1 through 22, but I'll be reading selected verses. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Bathsheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and uh, accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Just as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to me, but warn them solemnly and let them know that the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses. Others will plow his ground and reap his harvest. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and the best of your vineyards and olive groves and give them to his friends. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us and to go out before us and to fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, Listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, Everyone, go back to your own town. Be careful what you ask for. You might just get it. What we have just read describes the turning point in the history of the nation of Israel. They were moving from a nation that had Jehovah God as their leader to now wanting to follow an earthly leader. Now, a nation that is governed by God is a theocracy. Israel was re rejecting a theocracy and was demanding a monarchy uh, to be ruled by a king. They were, in fact, rejecting God's rule for man's rule. They wanted to be just like the nations around them, having a king that they could see rather than having a God that they couldn't see. You see, people, they trust what they see, not what they cannot see, because we tend to trust in our five senses rather than trust in God. And that is primarily because of the default sin nature that we are given at birth. And because of that tendency to depend on what we see and hear and smell and touch and taste, we sometimes tend to trust in our own instincts 
instead of trusting in God. And what happens is that we end up in a second best situation. World, World War I ace pilot, Eddie Rickenbacker, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, he found himself in that very same place. Now, for those of you who don't know, he was the founder and president of the now defunct uh, aircraft carrier lines, um, Eastern Airlines. Now, during World War II, um, in 1942, he was on his way to New Guinea to inspect the American troops there and to deliver a secret message to General Douglas MacArthur when his B-17 plane went down in the Pacific Ocean. Now, before that flight, he had received many, many accolades and medals of honor for his gallantry and successes as an ace pilot. So, uh, uh, to the extent that he was often referred to as the ace of aces for his flying skills and uh, all the successes he enjoyed uh, shooting down many of the enemy planes in um, aircraft battles during the war. The reason why his plane went down, why it went down in the Pacific Ocean, was because its fuel ran out. And uh, you may probably be saying, how can something like that ever be on such a critical mission during the war? Well, let me give you the real reason why the plane went down. Now, in the briefing that they received before they left, they were told that after a certain time and after uh, they had mon monitored the coordinates of their, their flight, um, monitoring it on their navigational instruments, they would come to a place where they would see a small island in front of them. But after looking at their instruments, as well as faithfully monitoring their coordinates throughout, you see, um, for, for the time period that was given, what they realized is that there was no island, no island ahead. All they saw was water. And later, they would learn that because of a pre-existing condition in the navigational system, which was caused probably by some kind of mishap, the main navigational instruments suffered what had been identified identified as a systemic bias, a systemic bias that corrupted the whole system, causing it to read wrong from the very beginning. Now, let me give you the translation to what I just said there. When the flight details and the navigational direction were programmed on uh, those instruments before takeoff, they did not know it, but the uh, systemic bias inside of the instruments had them reading those uh, instruments one degree off. And that meant, for anyone of you with a little mathematical mind, that from the very takeoff, their navigation uh, was faulty, their, their direction was one degree off. And uh, the further they flew, the further off course they would fly. So by the time they were supposed to land, the time they were supposed to see that small island, they were really a hundred miles off center just because of one degree. So they flew the plane, 
until the fuel ran out and eventually they had to ditch the plane in the Pacific Ocean. They had to ditch the plane because of a systemic bias that corrupted the whole navigational system. And I am here to tell you this morning that because of a pre-existing systemic bias inside all of us, something called sin, that that systemic bias corrupts our navigational system from the very start of, our, of the journey of life. So that from the very onset, we may program our lives to be in one place and because of that pre-existing bias inside of us, we are misdirected from the very, very beginning. And even with, with our best efforts, we may choose one place and end up somewhere else in life. So look with me at this telling story, which is tucked away in the Old Testament, uh, this story which involves a little prophet called Samuel. Now, God had defended Israel against the Philistines, and now at this point in time, the Philistines are subdued. The cities that they had taken from Israel were restored to them. There was peace between Israel and the Amorites, which allowed the prophet Samuel, uh, who was a kind of what we call a circuit prophet. Uh, he was now, he was able to go from Bethel to Gilgad to Mizpah all during the year, every year. And then he would go back to his home in Ramah, which today is called Ramallah which is in the West Bank of Jordan. So now things have quieted down in Israel. God had given them rest from their enemies and they begin to take notice that the Philistines, they have a king to lead them, a king to lead a physical, visible, kingdom, a physical, a visible nation, which that king had united together uh, under the Philistine rule. Now, they, Israel, recognizing that they themselves were a loosely organized nation, what they wanted now really was someone just like the other nations. They, too, wanted a king, a king who will pull all their tribes together, a king to give them some kind of organization and unity so that they could become a powerful military presence for themselves. Now, notice up to this point, Israel had never had anybody else but God to fight their battles. Up to this point, they never had anyone else but God to defend them, to support them, and to take care of them. But now, the situation is such that to them, God is dispensable. They can do without Him. God is not needed now because there are no enemies, there are no battles to fight. There's peace all around them. So they go to the prophet Samuel. Samuel, you know, you're old now. And your sons who are holding court in Bathsheba, they are dishonest and greedy and they are accepting bribes and as a result of that perverting the course of justice. So now we want you to make us a king to judge us just like 
all the other nations. Now, personally, if I had a choice as to who is going to govern my life, I am going God, Jehovah God, all the way. Yeah, put me down with God. Because God, he never lost a battle. Kings have. But God, he has never, ever lost one. Even when it seemed like Israel was on the verge of losing a battle, God showed up just in time. On one occasion, you remember, the, the sun would have set on them. But God said, let me show you how I can win a battle. So he spoke to the sun and he said, stop setting. And the sun stood still, the Bible says, hallelujah. Maybe not you. Maybe I'm speaking to the wrong group of people. But for me, if I had to go into any kind of battle, I want God to go with me because so far, so far, God, he has kept me on top of my game and he has seen me through victoriously through all of my battles. So for me, there's no greater general than Almighty God. So here is Israel. They are scattered around. They are loosely organized. And now they have a desire to have a physical, visible leader because they want to have what the Philistines have. They want to have what the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Amalekites have. They want to have what they have, their own kings. And uh, I'm speaking to somebody here right now. You, you be careful of what you ask for. You might just get it. God might give it to you. He might give to you what he doesn't want you specifically to have. He may give it to you what he didn't want for you. Now, so when you look at the very words in our text, you pick up a sense that God knows, he knows that what Israel wanted was second best. They wanted a monarchy rather than a theocracy. They did not want to be distinct, different from the other nations. They wanted to be like everybody else. Yet God has called us, his people, a peculiar people, a holy nation, to be separate in our lifestyle. So, Israel, they did not want to be distinct, peculiar in the eyes of God. They wanted a physical, visible king, rather than the invisible presence of the eternal God. They wanted someone that they could see, rather than the invisible God, who always, always reminds us in so many different ways of, of his absolute providential presence amongst us. So, Israel, they wanted to walk by sight, not by faith. They wanted a visible man, not the invisible God. And uh, I don't want you to miss this. Remember that God had given to Israel the, uh, the physical, visible Ark of the Covenant just to remind them of his viable spiritual presence with them. But what an all-able, all-wise creator had provided for them became insufficient 
for the very people that he had created. Give us a king, they said, so we could be like everybody else. What a shame, what a crying shame that you could have a choice and you would choose a Baal. You would choose a piece of stone, something that comes from yourself, something that you have created yourself, something that comes from amongst you, when you could have the true and the living God, the creator of the universe. What a shame that you would want to substitute a second best over Adonai God himself, the judge of all the earth. But you know, that's humanity. And because of this systemic bias, this pre-existing condition in the inside of us, that seems to, uh, to, to, to force us or to push us to gravitate to second best. And uh, the problem is that we keep doing it. We keep doing it. We keep doing the same thing over and over and over again against the best advice in the world. We keep gravitating to second best in our lives. When Jehovah God offers himself as numero uno, the ultimate, the most high, number one, yet we refuse him and we settle for every other God, every other God. So uh, you remember uh, the, uh, the scripture says, uh, as they have done from the day, this is what God is saying to Samuel, I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing it to you. Forsaking Jehovah God and serving other gods, that is exactly how we must call it, my friend. When we, when we choose second best, we are choosing every other God above us the true and the living God. Yes, what a shame. And as I said, we keep doing it over and over and over again, all the time against the best advice that comes to us. But let's take a moment and let us look at God's perspective on this whole thing and uh, try to understand a little about God's will in this matter. Hear what he says. It is not you, Samuel, they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king, God says. So the first thing that we have to note here is that <clears throat> we are called to be different from the world around us. God has called us to be holy, be holy, even as I, your God, I'm holy. See, he's called us to be holy because we are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. But many times, Christians, they don't want to stand out and be different. There are loads and loads of pressure for us to conform to the world. And as a result of that, so many of us choose to blend in with the world, blend in with the worldly lifestyles, with the worldly choices, not realizing that the extent to which we conform to this world is the extent to which that affects how we approach God in prayer. Now, the next thing that we need to see is that when we reject God's will for our lives, it is the very same thing as rejecting God himself. That is what God says. See, we come up with our own plans in life and we literally keep pressing God, pressing God to answer, uh, you know, our requests and meet our needs and so on, the way we, we want them met. 
but we don't realize that when we do things our way, there are consequences there. There are consequences. There are consequences, my friend, when you ask God for something that is second best. Yes. Remember uh, Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else would be added unto you. So God, he does not want to be second best. He does not want to be treated like that. Okay. So when you see you ask God for something that he knows is second best, there are consequences. And uh, this is what happens. You see, let me, let, let me show you from scripture here. Let's say God were to answer you, yes, this very moment. Let me show you what happens. Because in our text, God told Israel that as much as they wanted a king, that there would be some serious, serious consequences. God says that that king, he would be a despot, a tyrant. He will take your sons, he will take your daughters, he will take your crops, your fields, your harvest, he will oppress you with taxes. And uh, when that day comes, he says, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen and the Lord he will not answer you in that day how tragic how about in your relationships perhaps you are attracted to someone and you are saying God please God let it work out let this thing work out what if God were to say yes to you and it turns out not to be a good relationship? What if God were to say yes to you and you miss out either on a better relationship later on or you miss out on God's best for your life? You see, when you are wishing to be just like the others and not really wanting God's will for your life. God says, tell them, tell them that there are consequences. Samuel, tell them what they are going to get. Tell them what the consequences will be. So my question to you this morning is this, do you really want to be like the Philist Philistines? Do you? Do you really want to pay the price of choosing second best? Do you really want to be like other people, exploited, abused, marginalized? Really? You know, Sometimes we get into a situation that was not God's will, you know, for you. But now that you are there, now that you are there, you realize that some of the consequences cannot be reversed. That the decision you made cannot be changed. And the only reasonable thing for you to do is to stay right where you are, stay in that situation and love God the best you can and serve him right there where you are. And you also got to consider the stubbornness of your own heart and that God's yes to you may actually be God's discipline for you. Now, I can hear somebody trying to remind me that in the book of Deuteronomy, that God had already established, he had already prophesied, set that there would be a king. Yeah, but 
I want you to see this. God in Deuteronomy, he said that the king, that king would come out from a particular tribe, the tribe of Judah. But this king that Israel wanted, this king that they were looking at was not from the tribe of Judah. It was from the, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. Yeah, Benjamin, not Judah. Kind of close, you see. Well, yes, they kind of close Benjamin, Judah, but not the right one, my friend. Remember a uh, uh, story earlier? Remember one degree off can send you a hundred miles in the wrong direction. So you are saying you're trying to justify your choice. And uh, you're saying, well, Pastor, you know, the choice that I make is kind of close, close enough. You are trying to justify the choice that you should not have made. So you are trying to rationalize and say, well, it's kind of close, but, you know, close or close enough. Don't work with God at all because God is an exact God and he knows what is best for you. He knows exactly what is best for you. So let's look at the narrative here. We want a king. We want a king, Lord. So Israel, why don't you wait until I give you my king? the kind of king that I really want you to have. No, we want a king now, right now. So they would get Saul and he would fail. They would get David. He would have his faults. Solomon, he was all messed up. And Rehoboam, Boam, his son, he would split the whole nation. And uh, let me say something else here. When you start seeking after what God knows is a second best situation for you, oftentimes, often, God will send somebody to warn you of that second best choice that you're making. Hear what he says. Give them what they want. They are not rejecting you, Samuel. They are rejecting me and warn them of what they are going to get. You no, know, so Samuel comes to them. I really don't want to do this thing, you know, to give you what you have been asking for. But I want to warn you, Samuel says to Israel, I want to warn you and let you know that what you are asking for is going to be different, different from what you are really seeing. You know, so my friend, oftentimes, God will send somebody to say to you, stop, stop, don't go there, stop. It's not what you think it is. Stop, don't go. And I wish this morning that I could, could have said that I didn't know what I'm talking about here. I wish that I can say that all of this is just theory. But I know this. I really know this in existential reality, my friend, that when God says stop, you stop. When he says no, it is no. You know, this happened in Yosemite Park in the United States some years ago. There's a spectacle there that everybody wants to see. And it's a 317 feet um, waterfall cascading into a granite basin. 
people say that it is breathtaking and uh, so so people they will try to to you know inch up to walk up near enough to get a good view of it now along the way to viewing that waterfall there are many many prominent signs all along the way warning visitors of the dangers of getting too close to it in fact there is a park ranger with a sign saying don't cross the line stay out don't go in the waters they are calm looking but they are very very deadly don't go in and that's the reason why there are numerous numerous signs all along the way saying stay out danger stop deadly but the report says that people are so overwhelmed by the spectacle of the waterfall they are so taken away by the scenery and the majesty of the fall itself that those calm looking waters they seem so very inviting and uh, non-threatening they have even placed barricades with a sign saying absolutely absolutely under no condition are you to cross are you to enter now the only way for somebody to get past those barricades is really to climb over them and then they would have to literally walk 25 feet to get to the river itself the report uh, says that three young people 21 22 and 27 they didn't listen to the park ranger they didn't pay attention to the signs they climbed over the barricades and imagine this they walk those 25 feet to get to the water's edge and against every warning every warning not to enter the 21 year old girl she stepped into the water and immediately the undertow carried her out instinctively her 22 year old friend she jumped in and they were both taken down the 27 year old boy he jumped in to rescue them and all three of them went over the waterfall all three of them went over the cliff and drowned yes they all died but wait a minute they must have been thugs i mean you ignore all those signs and all those warnings and you still do that now nah, they must have been junkies out for some kicks or they must have been on dope or probably they must have been illiterate hustlers trying to have some fun and some adventure no no not at all listen to this they were all part of the central valley church who were out on an expedition you could be a church goer my friend you could be in a men's ministry in the women's fellowship in the youth group and read stop don't enter and still cross over we do that in our christian walk we do that with god we do that with his word but hear me now hear me now it didn't matter your position or your title or your education level 
God is speaking to you right now, this very minute, through this preacher. And he is saying, somebody, you need to hear what God is saying and not go there. Stop. Don't do it. And if God is saying to you, no, don't do it. Don't go there. Don't make that choice. I do not care really how calm and placid and pristine and beautiful and inviting the waters look. The waters where you are headed. God is still saying to you right now that that which you are seeing is just surface. What you're seeing is just on the surface, but beneath that surface, there is an undertow that can drag you off and kill you. So, you know what? You may want to reassess your position and ask yourself right now, what is it that I really want at this point in time? Do I want that which takes life away from me? Or do I want Jesus? Do I want him that gives life to me? Do I want to have my own way, do it my own way? Or do I want his way for my life? Let's just take a moment and begin to see how the Old Testament maps into the New Testament. Now, remember we spoke about the king that God uh, established in Deuteronomy? The king that God said would come from the tribe of Judah? Well, at the end of the Old Testament, that king still had not come. But the New Testament tells us that 2,000 years ago he came. And he came and when he came he hung on Calvary's cross, he rose from the dead and conquered death, hell and the grave. And he is the one who reminds us now that it is the thief who steals and kills and destroys. That he, that's what he came for. But Jesus says that he came, that he may give us life and give us life more abundantly. And I believe that somebody here this morning, you ought to be telling Jesus, Lord, I am sorry that I asked for second choice. That I went after my own will and not after your will. So Lord Jesus, give me the life, the abundant life that you promise. Yes, Jesus, that's what I need. So let me give you one last thing. And... Uh, this is what you've got to be careful of because look, listen to this when you keep nudging at god for what you want for uh, to have your own way when you keep nudging at god to give you something that he does not want you to have when you keep nudging at god when the Lord keeps saying no to you, no, no, he keeps saying no. But Lord, you are still there nudging. Lord, you know, if you'd only trust me. But God says, hey, I know that you cannot handle that. Yes, Lord, I can. You can trust me. No, I'm telling you, you cannot handle that. Well, Lord, you will never, ever trust me with anything at all. 
All right, God says, all right, like Israel. I do not know how much you think that you know, but go ahead, right on, have it. And the moment, my friend, that you know more than God, you have chosen second best. You know, some Christians, they hide under the teaching of God's perfect will and God's permissive will. And they, you know, they preach that as doctrine from Scripture. But that's not to be found nowhere in Scripture, you know. That teaching really came from a guy called Leslie Weatherhead. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. And before I say anything more, you need to know that God only has one will. Yes, one will. God only has one will. But what Weatherhead was really trying to do was to help us to understand how we can go about doing God's will. Doing God's will. So here goes, according to Weatherhead. And uh, from where I see it now, God's perfect will is always God's first choice for us. That's, God always has one choice for us. First, perfect, whatever you call it. And his permissive will then is this. Just what, uh, as we see in the text, let them have it if that's what they want. But you must know that's second choice. So second choice then is this, I'll let you have it because you always keep needling me about it, God says. But even when, you know, God lets you have your own way, his ultimate perfect will for you will never be compromised. That never changes at all, my friend. Even if he permits some stuff, ultimately, God, he will get what he's after. He is going to get his king when he wants his king. And that's the whole message of Christmas. He does not have to go through Saul and David and Solomon and Rehoboam and, and, and the divided kingdom of Israel. They were not the ultimate king that God wants. The king that God wants to reign over your life. Because there is another king, another king. Now in the New Testament, Herod, he thought that he was that king. So he tried to stop the, that little king, that little boy who possessed the power to control the universe. Now stay with me. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. So here is Israel. They want a king. The Ark of the Covenant had been taken away from them in battle. That Ark was God's localized presence in the world. Now the tabernacle, which was uh, the makeshift temple on the move that was designed in a certain way so you just did not walk into it any way you wanted to no there were protocols that everyone had to follow including the high priest now you would know that every detail of that tabernacle in the, in the wilderness testified and pointed to towards the person and the work and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. But there is one detail, one detail about our tabernacle that we cannot afford to miss because this is where, you know, the Old Testament uh, uh, maps into the New Testament seamlessly. So here, here, here it is. Around the Ark of the Covenant were the Levitical priests. <clears throat> and the 12 tribes of Israel 
which was, as I said earlier, made up of a loose federation of some kind of a government. They were on the move forward. And according to Scriptia, to the front were two tribes, to the back, four tribes. We're talking about the tabernacle that was middle, to the front of the tabernacle, two tribes, to the back, four tribes, to the east, three tribes, to the west, three tribes. Now, at ground level, it didn't look like nothing at all. But if you were to take an aerial view of that geography, looking down on the tribes from above, the revelation was the sheep of the cross. You see, from the Old Testament right through to the New Testament, the Lord, he always had the cross over his people to remind them that there is only one king. Hallelujah. Only one king who will rule over his people. One king, the only one king who is king of kings and lord of lords. The one king who is Jesus Christ our Lord. That one king to rule over every life. One king, only one king, King Jesus. Now, I remember in growing up, there was a game show on television. Uh, where where uh, there were doors in that show. It was called Let's Make a Deal. The host would remind us that behind each of the four doors, there was some kind of a gift. But behind one door only, there was the ultimate best gift. Jesus said, I am that door. And uh, that is what Christmas is all about. God's ultimate, first, and best gift to all of mankind. Jesus said, yes, he said that behind all the other doors, they are thieves and robbers. But he is the only door to eternal life. I am the door, he says, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find a pasture. Now, another thing is that all those other doors, they are really the closed doors of religion. Because before you can enter into those doors, you have to meet the entrance requirements. Yes, there's something that you must be in agreement with something, some uh, requirement that you will have to meet before you can go through that door. But you know what? Jesus, he is the only door with no pre-requirement. He says, come in as you are. Come in with your pre-existing systemic bias called sin because we are all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Behind all the other doors, there is eternal death, separation from God, hell. But Jesus, he offers you eternal life, my friend. So today, don't make church just a place that you are where you are present because i believe that the, that holy ghost has caught up with some of you because you have been going through doors that god has already said no to now you may have a lot to say about our church and a lot to say about the people of God, uh, the people of God who, whom he has planted here in this fellowship. 
and uh, you may want to say that yes we are all uh, that we are all hypocrites that may be so i don't know but that is no excuse for you to not walk to the door that god has opened today for you and this word that is being preached this morning reminds you that you could no longer hide behind somebody else for that decision that you will not make. There are some of you, you would leave here today and still not make that decision to turn away from second best that you have chosen. I want to close with this. There are two kinds of people who are here this morning. And to the first group, God is saying to you, the door is right here, right now. Are you going to pick this door or not? Or are you going to go through door one, door two, or door three? God is saying to you, don't you leave church today until you come through the only door called Jesus Christ, the only door that matters, the ultimate door that leads to the altar of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now to the next group. You know, you know that you are not walking in the middle of God's will for your life. You know <clears throat> that another king reigns in your life by your choice, just like Israel did. And you think that you can have it both ways. You think that you can keep God around just for convenience when you need him for your battles while you are serving under another king just like Israel wanted but a holy God a holy God has called you today to true repentance and this is how he warns you through his word if you insist on having a king he will conscript your sons as laborers and slaves and they'll be forced to plow and harvest his fields without pay. He will force your daughters to bake and cook and make perfumes for him. He will take away the best of your fields and the best of your vineyards and olive groves and give them to his friends. He will demand the finest of your young people and your animals and your flocks and a tenth of your harvest for personal gain. And hear this. You will shed bitter tears because of this king you are demanding, but the Lord will not help you. So the text goes on to say that the people, they refused to listen to Samuel's warning. And instead, they shouted, even though you say that to us, we still want a king. For we want to be like the nations around us. Our king, this king, will govern us and lead us into battle. And God's response to them in the last verse is this. Then do as they say and give them a king. I pray that you are not Israel this morning. I pray that you take heed and I want you to I want to leave on a note of hope here yes a systemic bias sends us in the wrong direction but the good news today is that we have someone who can recalibrate our navigational system and point us in the right direction in life my friend so you, you choose this day whom you will serve.
God or man? So, Father God, we thank you, Holy Father in heaven, that you have not judged us according to our sins, but you have had mercy upon us. Thank you, Lord, for sparing our lives, for giving us life with purpose. Your word says that you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. So we come before you this morning, Lord Jesus. We humble ourselves on bended knees. We surrender our hearts and our will to your will. That your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Wash us. Wash us and cleanse us through the washing of the water of your word. We acknowledge our sins and, and, and all our shortcomings and we ask, O oh God, for your forgiveness. Empower us now by, with Holy Spirit to walk from hence, from now on, in overcoming victory to walk in obedience and in willingness to do in all of your will. For the honor and glory of God we ask it done. And if you listening to me right now and you have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, if you are not born again now, is your opportune time. All you've got to do is to invite him in. All you've got to do is to say, yes, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. And now, if you'll stand and, release and receive the blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen and amen and amen. God richly bless you. See you next week. Have a great week.